This is the 18th season of Bass Talk Live. With your host, Matt Pankrat. BTL is brought to you by Lorenz, Bass Cat Boats, Apco, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, X Zone Lures, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank. Denali Rocks and Pro Guide Backwards. PTL coming at you. Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of BTL Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Big show today. So big I even shaved. And you know, our guest, he's always clean cut, got the smile going, lifting trophies up. So I, so I gotta, gotta get rid of the scruff. That would be. None other than Oklahoma's own Edwin Evers jumping on. He's had some time off, probably. I was trying to think, you know, June, there's always like kind of a little break there. Usually it's like that July, August, then the guys go up north. But there's like a substantial break on a lot of the tours. The Elite Series, uh, big break, BPT, uh, having a long break in the BPT. So I was talking uh, with Edwin a little bit behind stage and, he got bored and just decided to build a bunch of ponds. So we'll talk to him a little bit about what's going on with that. Also, uh, maybe look back at some of the the uh, past tournaments of his uh, of his career, involved in a lot of uh, a lot of cool events. That you know, I'm kind of a historian of the sport. I cringe to say that, knowing we had Ken Duke on yesterday. I can't hold a candle to him, but uh, uh, we'll talk to Edwin about that. Also. Uh, Jacob Wheeler overtook one of his records. You know, I mentioned uh, mentioned on the show yesterday uh, that uh, uh, Wheeler won another cup, another uh, MLF cup, the fourth of his career. And I did not realize this. I was reading it over on a Bass Fan that Edwin has three cups. So we'll talk to him in that, uh, depending on what happens in the future, I believe is, is a record that will um, stay there for a while because of the, the cups from what I understand maybe I think they're transitioning to the team series uh, and a, a, a BPT uh, event that I am extremely high on and uh, we'll talk to Edwin about what it was like uh, being part of that inaugural uh, kind of like a pilot uh, team series uh, event for uh, the BPT and MLF uh, that was I believe on uh, Lake Garcia down in Florida so all sorts of stuff to get to on a Wednesday, June 29th, last uh, last full week of, of live shows before we go to some recorded shows as I head up to Oneida for the uh, Bassmaster Open and then Kurt Dove's Pro Bass Camp the following week after that and then ICAST in Orlando, Florida the week after that. So let's bring uh, Edwin in. Looking very patriotic this morning with a, uh, with a number of flags. I'm sure there's some stories behind both of those flags, uh, Edwin. Welcome to BTL. Thanks for jumping on. Man, thanks for having me on here. It's always an honor, Matt. What's the deal with the flags behind? Those look like they've been flown in some pretty cool places. You know, we were talking earlier, you're going to Oneida, and this came from some friends that I met at Oneida. He was actually an auctioneer, some big fans. You've, you've met him before, you know, in all the events that you've covered. And uh, it's, it's when Oklahoma got inaugurated into the uh, United States in 1907. It's actually a 1907 flag pretty cool and then this right here uh james d wells uh man he just he just kind of a cool deal he gave me that 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 flag he flies a, a helicopter black hawk and uh man he just he, he gave it to me and my family um it's just an honor that that i don't know a serviceman wanted to fly a flag for me over there doing what they do i pretty cool guy right there i've got to meet him and just thought it was something neat to frame and put in the house. Absolutely, especially heading into Fourth uh, of July weekend. Big yeah. plans, big plans for the Fourth of July weekend, Edwin. You know, my my women love fireworks, so I'm sure we will go to all the fireworks shows we can possibly go to and see them again and again. <laughs> and so, uh, no, we don't really have anything too big. We'll probably go out to the lake and grill and 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 tube uh, right here on Uligal and. Uh, 
hang out with some family. We've got a big family reunion just a day or two afterwards. Uh, we've got people come in from Canada and Florida and just hang out for a few days. Don't you have a big enough spread to where you can do like your own fireworks and blow up stuff and go to the fireworks store and buy all the fancy stuff and like no one I'm yells at you? Do, I'm too cheap to do that. I, if I will buy like a hundred dollars worth, but that's all it will be. I'm not going to be out there spending thousands of dollars worth. That's not me. Is this one of the longest breaks you can remember in your professional without, fishing career? Yes, without a doubt. It's it's just I just like normally you don't get to stay at home and like if you're home a week or two weeks and it's like oh it's time to start getting everything ready you know it's time to go it's time to go and i keep looking at the calendar like man something's got to be off because I, I i need to be getting ready to go and heck i still got a lot of time before i have to go somewhere so it's pretty exciting yeah two uh two full months yeah off it's, it's, for between uh between watts bar that was in june and then stage six which is on uh Cayuga, a place that you're very uh, familiar with, have been there a number of times and is a really, really good fishery. Like you have to be excited to get up there and, and Cayuga. I love that lake. I mean, it's just so cool. Um, so cool. And, and they caught that eight pound. Eight five. That thing was yeah. nuts. Yeah. That, 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 we, I don't ever remember catching like five pound smallmouth. No. There, let alone four pound. And they're telling me there's eight pounds. So that's, Something might have changed there, uh, but no, I, that lake is like, you know, in my career, early in my career, you could used to go flip a one ounce jig at Rayburn or Toledo Bend and braid and and just whack on the large mouth. And, and I, I'll, I'll never forget the first time we were ever up there, I was flipping a one ounce jig and just catching them. And I think Hackney won doing that. And it, it's just a cool lake, uh, just full of fish and beautiful. Uh, I mentioned the uh, MLF Cups. Uh, that's the, uh, I don't want to call them like a made-for-TV event, but they are like, they're filmed in the dark. And then if you're around everyone, like that's what your buddy texts you, like, dude, they're on this lake and blah, blah, blah. And then I remember one guy was, one of my buddies was fishing. He said, I'm just, I was just out fun fishing. He's like, and I didn't know anything. He's like, I put it at this little ramp, nothing. He's like, I come around the corner. He's like, and Skeet Reese is in a boat doing an interview. And like this boat was like, you got to get out of here, man. You're not supposed to be seeing this. And he's like, I didn't even know what was going on. He's like, I, he's like, that's what he messaged me. He's like, what is going on? I was like, I'm assuming it had to be a cup or something like that. He's like, yeah. He's like, it was top secret, man. <laughs> uh, but uh, I bet you you have three of those uh, cup wins. Wheeler just got his fourth win to take to take one of your uh, one of your records away. I, I, it's uh, I think he'll have a lot of records in another. 10 to 15 years like that but uh uh i'm i'm curious i'm not sure how to cover the cups edwin because it's like the post thing you've won three you're one of the winningest guys you fished in a lot of cups where do you rank the uh mlf cups that are that that air on tv that are for where you've got classic trophies and and red crests and angler of the years and elite so you've got it all where do you like how do you where does the an MLF cup fit into the mix. If you were to put it, you don't rank all of them, but just in the hierarchy yeah. of them. I know for me, I love fishing the cups just a little, I mean, because a lot of them took place in the fall. Uh, a cool thing about the cups for me was we would go get in that truck in the morning and like the boat official would just, you'd be driving to a lake and you would have no clue where to go where you were going. And, you know, you always tried to look at road signs. I just got through the years just to just take a nap basically. And, and when you get to the lake, then try to figure it out. But I always, I always liked that because you had to break that lake down that day, no practice, no information. And, uh, you know, as far as, as, as to answer your question on how, 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 how they rank, um, they're pretty high for me because, you know, when, when you when you make the final round and Kevin Van Dam's in it and Jacob Wheeler and Takahiro and, and you know, whoever it is, you're still beating guys that, that have made a career bass fishing and a really good career on a lake that you've never seen before or, or you have no knowledge of. Uh, so they, they rank really, really high for me. I, I'll, I'll never forget the first one I won. It was on, on Caddo Lake down in 
Louisiana, you know, and just to have Kevin come up and congratulate you, it, it means the world to you because, you know, you, you beat him. And, and that was one of the, always one of the guys that you want to beat, you know, growing up or, or, or competing every day. So they're probably a little bit different from the media aspect and, and the fan aspect because, yeah, they did try to film those in the dark, so to say, so they would appear live on television or, or you know, nobody could know the, the outcome of it. Mm -hmm. So people would watch it on TV. But, uh, you know, for me, they rank pretty high. I, I put those trophies right there on that wall with all the other trophies and, uh, you know, no particular order. But um, I'm pretty proud of them, I guess, to answer your question. That's kind of the original MLF format, like take the BPT out of it, go back to what, 2011, Lake Amistad, everyone was down there slinging Alabama rigs and stuff, and they filmed it. That's like kind of the the core. That's how it all I'll kind of started, and that's how it was for like eight or nine years, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. I'll never forget that event. Uh, pretty neat. I think Kevin might have won that one. Him or Brent Ayler did, but they were catching him on that Alabama rig and a the, the deep diving crankbait over the tops of trees. But uh, it was neat because you just – you had to figure out the fish and you never could stop catching them. Um, and you had to figure them out that day and, and, and without any knowledge of being on that body of water, which was super cool. Um, so the way I understand it, the cups are kind of transitioning this upcoming year to uh, general tire team series. And yes, I hope it, there's, I, I know there's like stuff that's coming out that hasn't come out, but basically there's like been a draft and you guys are on teams, but they came out with an original one on Lake Garcia down in Florida. And I had Joe Pogger on from MLF to talk about it. And uh, uh, I mean, I've never been like a, uh, I've never hit a secret. Like I've never gotten into the cups just because of the deal, like at a, and the live and the, just covering every, but I got into the team deal and I, liked it and i learned from it and and you were a part of that inaugural one down there on garcia i'm, I'm laughing because you know i learned from it i had bobby lane and chris lane as my two partners and i had like you know just to give everybody a little bit about what what's going to transpire we're going to have headsets or ears, you know. Yeah, you got to figure that out because some, like, you had, like, Brian Thurf, like, talking into, it, like, a walkie-talkie sub and stuff. Like, well, you guys will get that all ironed out. Yeah, basically, they're going to be in your ear. And down there at Garcia, ours worked perfectly. Uh, I had Bobby and Chris Lane in my ear the entire day talking about fishing. And, and I just, looking back at it, it was one of the funnest days of fishing I ever had. You know, Bobby was like, steady the ship, man. Let's go steady the ship, you know, and, 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 and they all, they just had sayings throughout the day mm -hmm. and uh, it was a lot of fun to, to listen to them, to hear them, uh, you know, two brothers going back and forth at each other, you know, where you at, get over here, you know, I'm doing this and they're doing that. And as far as learning bass fishing, you know, that's one thing, you know, people always filming, you know, are like, man, think out loud. Well, with that cut, with that team series, you're thinking out loud, to your partners trying to help them, you know, like, man, I'm going to try this bait, you know, on this type of banks, uh, because of this, you know, maybe you could go try this over here or, or you know, doing this on, on offshore. And you're just all the time communicating and, and talking out loud. If you got a bite, if you thought you got a bite, if you thought you saw a fish and, uh, it was a lot of fun to fish. And I think it's going to be a really, really neat from, from the fan aspect of just, what goes through a pro angler's head as he's trying to figure out a body of water. And, and you guys are forced to vocalize it because there's money on the line and there's a title on the line. I think, so listen, Edwin, I think basically it's making all of you fish like, like Amart fished stream of consciousness, talking out loud. That's why people loved Aaron. Like what went through his head yeah, is he, what he said and it was almost you know like he felt because you knew what he was going like yeah. that's what you guys are i remember with the grass and stuff like i learned more about like a grass edge in florida mm -hmm. in t in the first 10 minutes of that show between the the between what what chris and bobby and then uh 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 what ayler was doing uh for I, whatever team squincher i've got it pulled up yeah. now then and dude you're giving up these gold nuggets for the anglers because you're trying to it, there's no bs like there's oh, no yeah. you can't hold you're, anything back because you're, you're screwing not, your teammates yeah. 
yeah, like like I'll I'll, I'll never forget. You know, Andy had Brian Thrift on on his team, and and uh, good friends with Andy, and he's like, man, Brian is so secretive about certain baits, and he wouldn't hardly give up, you know, what jerk bait he was throwing, you know, to his own teammates. And, and uh, yeah, so some, some stuff's really going to come to light for those fans. You're going to really see what's happening. And so that's going to be filmed all, all across the country in four events next year then? Yep. Four events. Uh, we had a draft, um, it was really kind of cool, uh, to be, to, to go through a draft process, basically the, the, the top guys in the points, um, uh, you just drafted the rest of the guys. So there'll be three man teams. Um, I know, uh, we all know what event we'll be competing in. You know, I think there's an event maybe in September and October, November and December and, and, uh, be three teams. And then you're going to have a championship and, and, you know, one team's going to walk away with 300,000 bucks. Do you ever potentially see this being the future of the sport like do you ever see like edwin evers you're on a team in 10 years and to where it almost flips to where bass fishing becomes a team sport or will it always be an individual sport in your mind other sports have tried it like bull riding has certain teams you have like race car teams and stuff like is there a future in this to where you could be like the captain of like the Oklahoma bush flippers. <laughs> and, and, and I don't know. You know, you think about, you know, some of those other sports really aren't team sports, but in, in bass fishing, you know, we were talking earlier how much we love fishing jackpots Thursday night and Tuesday night jackpots. And those are always team events. So it really relates good back into the bass fishing world. I think, I don't, I don't think you'll ever lose the individual aspect of it, but I think it sure could be a really strong leg to it to support it because so many people everybody in bass fishing at one point or another has fished team tournaments whether it be a club level a pro-am type deal and i think it can relate to the general guy going out there on a saturday morning fishing a, a team derby uh, i'd like to see it someday you know if we could get it to where we're both in the same boat you imagine putting bobby and chris in the same boat going down the line flipping i mean there'd be stuff flying everywhere yeah no i would rather i would rather mixed team boats so like like you would be in the boat with thrift and then like skeet would be in the boat with chris to where it would it would harken back to the old school pro on pro draw days oh yeah and then it would also bring in some elements of uh ultimate match fishing mm -hmm. and that it, it would that would be the the chaos of it all but yeah no it's a it's an interesting interesting concept did you participate in any of those early ttbcs when it was the team format back with like kelly yeah. jordan and big dave smith and all that that was yeah, kind of the it, first it, genesis of the team. Of yeah that was a lot of fun what did you guys think of it back then because that was really the first time in professional fishing history that you had to open up the playbook a little bit and that was back when stuff was secretive that was back yeah. when you guys had, you know there wasn't yeah. a live cameras or do you you caught them on whatever you said you caught them on in the in the interview yeah. the rest I, of it was unknown you know those were you know looking back at those events matt those were some of the coolest events that we ever had as far as the tent you'd come back and eat in the tent you'd have the live leaderboard uh you know you fished half the day you're off half the day your other teammates were out in the afternoon. You're pulling for them. You know, you kind of had a powwow before you went out. Those were a lot of fun. And, and this is kind of a spinoff of that a little bit. Uh, you bringing those up, those are cool, cool events. Do you follow what's going on with this live golf at all? A little bit. Man, they, they kind of all have uh, gone a different direction, getting paid a lot of money to do it. Yeah, they're doing like the team concept deal and it's the money and they're changing the format and the shotgun start. I've talked, there's so many parallels to what's going on and every, but the more you dig into it, the more you realize it happens in every, pretty much every individual sports try, like done it at some point or another and then pushed the pro progression of the sport as a whole. It's just interesting. But the it team format is what I was what I thought was interesting was that they were coming out with the team format and they're like, what the heck is this? But it's just the same with the with the fishing, except the fishing, I think, is a way more educational. Yeah, that's one thing about it. That team, team format will be super educational for the fans. Somebody wanting to learn or a high school guy, college guy. 
just myself, heck, a pro guy, I, I will really enjoy watching how that stuff unfolds and just different fishing styles and, and uh, you know, picking your teammates in that draft was pretty interesting, you know, just how all that went down and, and uh, you know, trying to think about people's fishing styles and that time of the year. Uh, it's going to be really neat as this evolves each year. All right, we're going to take our first break, but when we come back, I want to uh, I want to dive into a text that you sent me uh, last week when I asked if you could be on the show. Uh, I'll just read the uh, I'll just read it. I'll just read the comment. I said, "Hey, are you available to jump on BTO Wednesday morning at eight thirty? He said, "Yes." He said, "Are we going to talk about how bad my season is going?" And at that point, I said, "Well, I thought I was on top of things, but maybe I better pull up the rankings." to see where you're at maybe i've made a horrible mistake and edward is just at a downward spiral no you're in 22nd overall i knew you had made a run at at uh red crest and and heavy hitters and that's why i said dude i said uh you're in 22nd let's not get carried away here and then you said something that i that i uh that i thought was interesting you said you're only as good as your last event and my last two events were horrible they weren't very good. <laughs> so I, I would like you to dive into that to that theory and thought process if you're uh, willing and able when we come back uh, after the break. Sound good? Okay. Yes, sir. All right, BTL on Wednesday with Edwin Evers. Your key to better fishing this season is Elite FS, now available at a new lower price. Get Elite FS9 today for $9.99, and we'll throw in a CMAP reveal chart, our premium mapping solution for free. Elite FS works with all state-of-the-art Lorenz sonar, from chirp, side-scan, and down-scan imaging with fish reveal to high-resolution active target live sonar. Elite FS9 and CMAP reveal. Offer ends August 31st. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Bass Cat. Feel the rush. When you're catching fish for a living, you can't let a little cold, rain, heat, humidity, or anything else get in the way of a payday. I wear APCO. Any fish, any water. The KVD 100 Jerkbait. 15 different colors. A perfect combination of roll, wiggle, and flash. Increased castability. 3D eyes. Premium black nickel hooks. KVD. Tie one on. Striking lures. Are you looking to install your own fishing electronics? Well, the Bass Tank is here to help you. The solution is the Bass Tank Power Harness. It takes the guesswork out of installation. No more voltage issues or interference. Designed by an engineer so that you can get professional results right there in your own garage. Installation done right with the help of the Bass Tank Power Harness. You can feel confident knowing that your installation was done right. The Bass Tank Power Harness. Give us a call or order yours today at thebasstank.com. Welcome back, BTL, on a Wednesday with Edwin Evers. I was remiss. I did not mention in the opening of the show that the NPFL made a bold move by going up to uh, Saginaw Bay in the end of June uh, for a three-day event up there. Lots of smallmouth up there. I don't know if you've followed that. Some guys from Oklahoma, Shelly Collins in there, John Soko. Uh, but can they get three days on Saginaw Bay in a row, Edwin? Or would that be a miracle? Remember... What event was it? Was it Escanaba? Where was the <laughs> Angler of the Year event where it there. literally took like a week and a half to get three days of fishing in? I'll never forget that. Me and Jason were staying in a little cabin, and, and that wind blew so hard that like where we were at, we were on the water, 
and it would come up and almost flood the yard because it was blowing in so hard to the back of that pocket. And then like all of a sudden all that water would be gone. It'd be like a foot, two foot lower. And uh, it's just amazing how that wind can rise the, the, the water up there. Yeah. We were there forever. We drove around in the country. We were, I was looking for bears and we just were bored, like spent days and days up there. I think there was th- three days canceled in a row. Yeah. I remember, imagine how bored I was. I was just trying to cover it. I just wanted to interview. I wasn't even going to get to fish afterwards. <laughs> I remember yeah. where they had the meeting at that event, uh, Edwin. You mentioned you were on a team with with Chris and Bobby Lane. Well, I'm up there, Jeff, you know, Jeffrey's, we got to get content. We can't, you can't just be sitting around on your butt for three days. Well, that meeting there had a little game room in it. And in the game room was like a, a Sega Genesis bass fishing game, arcade. Yeah. And you had a roller ball where you'd roll. And, and uh, Dave Rush and I were in there. Well, one of the lakes was Okeechobee. And you guys were at the at the meeting and so we had Chris and Bobby were both in it, and they both had their jerseys on. Well, here's Sega Gen- Genesis, the Sega or whatever it was. The yeah, we were like, dude, like, can we double mic you and have a one on one on Lake Okeechobee? Well, yeah, let's do it. Come on, hand pow, woo! So we get them both in there, and it got wild. I mean, Chris kept breaking them off. Bobby kept landing four pounders and just talking mad crap. Chris is punching the machine. Bobby's celebrating. It was like a half hour deal that we put out and it got like more views than any of the tournament coverage afterwards. I, I, I can't <laughs> only imagine. I think I think people were bowling up there. I think that was the only thing around. I don't even know if there was golf courses up there. I mean, it was it's pretty remote, Escanaba, and, and I think there was a little bitty bowling alley. It's probably the most business they had done all summer long or all fall was when we showed up and started bowling every day. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, dude, you haven't had a bad year. 22nd overall, obviously, by uh, by your standards and what we've seen in the past. You're used to catching one every third cast. Eleven uh, thirty seventh made a run at uh, Heavy Hitters, uh, made a run at uh, Red Crest. Uh, no, yeah, no, you were 27th. Yeah. Fifth, you were fifth at heavy hitters, right? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Anyway, you've had a fifth, a seventh, a twenty seventh. Your last, but your last two events, uh, forty seventh and sixty seventh. And then you sent me that text that said, "Ah, oh, you're only as good as your last event." What did you mean by that? I don't know. I just guess I was frustrated with you know. I, I feel like in this event or in this sport, when you get complacent or you get satisfied, you're probably not going to fish the next event as hard as you should and uh or you know with the same intensity or or same drive and and uh i just you know i I don't ever you know it's kind of odd that i have trophies up because i never did my wife did all that and uh you know i just i never wanted to like be content or be satisfied I, i always wanted to strive to to do better in the next event or the next day or the you know i just and uh, I, I feel like, you know, you truly are only as good as your last event because that's what you're remembered by. Um, I don't know what else to say about it. I just, I, I, that's how I feel. Like, you know, the last event's probably what measures how, how I did or how, how I, you know, how I was. You know, you, you uh, I don't know, that's just how I, that's how I played, I guess. Uh, are you a win or it's a failure, dude? Or are there events that you finish 20th in where you leave and you go, you know what? I fished a heck of a derby. Oh, without a doubt. They're, they're, like I, I still, to this day, I think one of the absolute best tournaments I've ever fished in my life, I, I think I finished 12th, is at the Chafalaya Basin. And uh, I had people all around me, and, and none of them even made a, 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 a remotely got close to a check. But I finished 12th, and I had figured out this flipping – deal in a mat and and everybody was flipping but i had found some little difference some little nuance in that that mat that i promise you you could flip it like if if i was looking for this thing that was that big and if you could flip it right here you could flip it right here you could flip it right here and never get a bite but if you put it right there and i I know that sounds silly but i mean it's like four inch difference a two inch difference in this mat and there were elite anglers in this, in this event. And, and I just, I was catching, I was going through 400 pieces of plastic a day 
And uh, it was, uh, to this day, I still think it was the best event I'd ever, you know, one of my best events I'd ever fished and I didn't win, but I, I made every decision perfect. I didn't lose any fish. And, and yeah, I, I can be completely satisfied with an event if, if, if I, you know, felt like I fished mm -hmm. well and, and made good decisions and, and, uh, you know, just stayed focused throughout the day and didn't have any hiccups. So, no, I, I don't have to win every event to be satisfied. I, I just want to, at the end of the day, know I, I did the best I could and, and made good decisions. At, at this point in your career, when you are, when you do struggle or do you have a bad event, do you, do you usually find it's because of, of poor decision making or because of poor execution? Big difference there. Yeah, huge difference. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit of both, but most of the time, 90% of the time, I would say it's always decision-making. Okay. You know, the last event at Watts Bar, I go to start on the face of the dam, and I was, <laughs> I don't know, 65th, 70th boat out, and I get down there, and there's, I think, four or five boats on it, and and I'm like, man, I can't do it. And I'm running away and there's three more boats running to it. Well, I come back about one o'clock and Ryan is still sitting right where they're at. There's a local boat sitting on the other side of it where the other fish were at. And I like, I pull up there for like 20 minutes and I ask both of them, man, can I get in here? All right, yeah, come on. But I mean, I'm just like, it's like how that current hit that dam. There was like a dead spot in the middle and I knew I was wasting my time and Ryan wasn't moving the, the local guy. He was, I, I just, it was frustrating, you know, because that that's the part that I get aggravated about. But in my mind, I felt like I should have had enough backup stuff and I felt like I did. It just wasn't near as good. You know, I didn't have near the confidence in it to still have a good event and I didn't have a good event at all. You know, you've got a plan for that, you know, knowing that a spot like that, you can't put all your eggs in that basket because you may never get on it. Do you still fish like where you're like going down the bank and you're like, I'm not going to catch anything. This sucks. I don't know what to do next. Like this, I'm clearly, this is not the thing to be like you, even at this point, Edwin Evers, you, you said you didn't have the confidence in it. Do you still have like those doubts in your mind when you're fishing in events well, when I say I didn't have the confidence in it, like how that water hit that dam, like there was an eddy on this side where a bunch of fish were, and there's an eddy yeah. on this side where a bunch of fish were. I just, I didn't have confidence that I was going to catch anything. Okay, so well, you understood I, it. Yeah, I shouldn't have pulled up there. I mean, it was just a waste of time, but I was trying to get in there and then see if I could get to where I wanted to get, and it wasn't happening. You know, they they knew right where they needed to be also. Uh, but no, yeah, there's times when you're just, you do get lost, you know, uh, uh, absolutely. Um, you, but I try to, you know, you try not to, you just always, I always try to be on the mental side of the game. I think so much of our sports mental that, that man, you're, you're going to find them. You're the next, the next stop, you know, you can load the boat and, and we've all done it in our, in, in your career that it just takes, the right cast you know the right little stretch and you can get well and and especially in the bass pro tour format you don't need much time to get back up into that leaderboard you could have the worst first day ever and make an adjustment the next day and and you know heck possibly win the round or or just make the next cut so i don't get down on myself during an event you know like or lose my confidence during an event um if that's what you're asking me yeah. It's cool you mentioned that. Not cool for you. Uh, cool for the listeners and cool for the story. Uh, we had uh, I had Ryan on the show, and he talked for like 30 minutes about the face of the dam and waiting it out and knowing there'd be five or six other guys and where he needed to be, when he needed to be there, and all of his experience on Pickwick and TVA fisheries and on how the current works differently on the surface of the water than it does below the water and whether you're dropping the bait or floating the bait and the vertical structure that comes out based on the horizontal structure and the bait. I mean, it was like, you know, it looks like a guy that's just pitching something up to a wall, but, you know, like what you just talked about and what he talked about a lot more going on there than just cast into a brick wall yeah there's a lot going on there a ton going on there i yeah i was pretty excited because when i found those fish in practice uh they weren't easy to catch you had to to do a few things as far as getting your bait to drift with that current and, and the size of the bait and and there was so many bass there i mean just hundreds upon hundreds of bass 
And uh, I was pretty excited about it. I, but I, at the same sense, I, I told Andy and Odd, I was like, man, I, I told him about it. I was like, I don't know that I'll ever get on it. You know, I don't know that I'll ever be able to be a part of it. And, and Ott calls me after the event's over. He said, man, you haven't drove off a cliff yet, have you? And I wasn't even watching. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, he won on the face of the dam. And I was like, dad, you got How does that work on the t- – do you guys still do like an individual – take off before your 15 minutes to get like how does that work now like if yeah, you wanted it's, it's to be on that up. spot okay so it's and that's random uh yeah it's it's flip-flopped every two events so like you okay. know that yeah it's it's every okay. two events then, so if you had had like boat one you could have just gone and sat there for 15 minutes like on the i would have yeah absolutely yeah. Okay, yeah. I just didn't know if it was yeah. since since it wasn't you know it was a start fishing time. It was a boat. If you're asking me, it was a boat race that morning. I was going as fast as I could to get there, along with the other five people in front of me. So, yeah, mm-hmm. I wasn't idling around or goofing off. It, it, it was still a boat race trying to get there. I like it. Um, I I got kind of re- reflective recently because you know you posted that you're a grandpa now, which is. <laughs> It's hard to believe. It's super hard to believe. It it is. It's uh, I, I have never seen my wife. I think at nighttime, if you were to wake up in the middle of the night, that smile on her face is permanently <laughs> ingrained. She she had not seen Luca for two days, and she had to go yesterday and spend the day with with him. Uh, that's my grandson because they were leaving to go on a little vacation down to Carlton Landing. Uh, with uh, my son-in-law side of the of the of the family, and uh, she is super excited. It, I, I'm really excited. Don't get me wrong. I'll be re- really excited once he's out of the the pooping stage and the sleeping stage and the eating stage. There's just nothing I can do for him right now. You know, I he he when he gets to hey grandpa, let's go fishing or let's go hunting. I'm gonna have a lot of fun with this kid. Be and, the first uh, three year old to tie an FG knot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty cool though. My uh, my daughter's doing really good, and she's just a phenomenal mom. And it's it's going to be a lot of fun watching this all grow up. Uh, but I say that because I was like, man, it's hard to believe it's been it's you know that you're a, a grandpa now, which got me going back and thinking about the earlier days before I even moved to uh, to Oklahoma. But I always like to go back and and just look at uh, look at guys who are at the top of their game now trends was there something that happened was there a time Mm -hmm. and i was surprised i I had never done that with 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 you before and um i i think it's interesting because when you started like your first two or three years you had some success you had some top tens in the in the uh invitationals and in the uh top 150s but it wasn't quote Edwin Evers yet like you weren't a dominant force to where a 67th was a shock and a 47th was a was a shock like you had a stretch in in 2000 you went 149th 46th 124th 104th 132nd 98th back to back in 2021 yeah now look at look at where you are today I'm big on building foundations learning as anglers always moving forward you talked about that earlier now just three or two short years later, 2003, you have a stretch of third, 52nd, third, ninth, fifth, seventh, and fourth. My question to you is, we all struggle as anglers. We all get our teeth kicked in, and we all have people who go, hey, maybe this isn't for you. What was it that when you were just eating up triple-digit finishes, you said, you know what, I'm pushing through this, and 24 months later, five out of six top tens in the exact same tournaments you know there's a lot to it uh, one that 2000 season I, I i was brand new that was the first year that i qualified for the uh is the bp top 150 back then i believe i i didn't know anything i i at that time in my career i wanted to be denny brower i never wanted to fish deeper than five feet i'd never offshore fished i i, I you know I was just a kid that fished Lake Texoma all the time and, and knew how to put a bunch of brush piles out there and catch fish out of brush piles and win a few boats. And uh, I had a lot to learn, a lot to learn. You know, I fortunate I got to fish with some people at Table Rock, kind of taught me how to use a spinning rod and how to fish deep. And and uh, I just, one, I was single. 
I didn't have any responsibility as far as kids and wife or, or like, you know, I lived in a camper for a while and I had a trailer house that I paid 7,500 bucks and I borrowed the money to buy the, the trailer house from my grandma. And, um, uh, I just, I didn't have responsibilities, but it got, it, you know, to, to, it got so bad that in 2002 at Lake Seminole Megabucks, I'm in 98th place going into after the first day. And uh, I'll never forget, like, that was like the biggest turning point for me. Um, man, I, I went to that focus meeting and I'd always gone to church and done those kinds of things, but I just, I never really was fully committed to, to living, living my life the right way. And I'll never forget. I just, I prayed that night to, to, I just wanted to quit struggling. I struggled so bad. I was like, man, God, if, if I need to be a bus driver, if I need to be a car salesman, if I need to be whatever I need to be, I just want to know. And, uh, like, I just was tired of struggling. I was, I had been doing it all on my own. And that next day I caught the biggest stringer of that tournament on Lake Seminole sat there and caught them every cast and made it all the way up to 16th. So I kind of got the answer through prayer of what I was supposed to do in life. And, uh, ever since that day, you know, I, uh, my fishing has been really good and my priorities have been where they needed to be. And, and, uh, man, that's just how I live my life and the faith that I have with it. Um, uh, I had one other year there that I had, didn't make the classic or the end of the year championship. And that was in 2009 and kind of interesting story behind that, uh, that entire year, everything that went wrong could have gone wrong. Like I had the wrong time in my depth finder. When I went to California, I had 21 pounds in my, in my, in my live well. And I'm running up the river to uh, to Stockton to, to weigh in. And I noticed everybody else in my flight was going back down the river to load their boat. It was about a five, 10 mile ride up that river. And I'm like, there goes Kenyon Hill. And there goes Jeff Reynolds. And they were all in my flight. I'm like, dad gummit, what's well, something's going on here? You know, why would they all be leaving early? Well, I didn't change my clock on my GPS by two hours. I only changed it by one hour. And I completely lost all my 21 pounds. Another event, I had my live wheels turned off at Wheeler and didn't know it killed my whole catch. Just stuff like that happened throughout the whole year. Wow. And I missed a classic that year by one place. But kind of fast forward, there was a kid that wanted to do a catch a dream trip. And the only week that that kid would have been able to go fishing was the week of the classic between his chemotherapy sessions. Like he was so unhealthy that that it's so hard on him that he had one week in his life that he was able to do it and it was during that week of the classic and that i mean i was so distraught you know up until like for not making the classic but then when i saw the big picture and that i was supposed to take him fishing and we went and had a had a super memorable fishing trip down on falcon while everybody else was at the classic and uh i don't know it's just kind of neat how how the big picture of all that really works while we're on the old derbies, my hometown, Decatur, Illinois, uh, I remember I th I thought that was a cool event. I liked the All Star events. Uh, I I thought that was really neat. They took the twelve. There was like I think a fan vote, and then some of the top for the Angler of the Years, and you split it up between Shelbyville and Lake Decatur. Mm -hmm. uh, two just juggernaut bass factories <laughs> in Central Illinois, but. Uh, like I said, I like I, I don't think I've ever asked you about it. it's ten years past this now. I remember on Lake Decatur, you ended up somehow in the Sangamon River where I don't think a glass boat had been in five or six years. Big time silt problem in Lake Decatur. Also big time problem with lack of fish. But the silt problem was also an issue. And I just remember my you know, I grew up there, I fished there, and people were like, How did Edwin get up there? And <laughs> what do you re what do you remember about that event? Because didn't you have to like get towed in and stuck and run through mud and wake? Wasn't that just a total debacle? It was. So you know the problem with that river is if it was in Oklahoma, you would just blow across it like it was this deep, and you would just line your boat up sixty miles an hour and you blow right across that mud flat. 
But up there, they had no wake buoys the whole way. So you could not run it, you know, legally in our events. You know, I'm sure mm -hmm. the locals might have. So I figured out that it was soft enough that, that you know, and I've dug ditches with that mercury before, and you just trim that mercury down, and it'll plow through water. And I just, wah, and I'd go until it overheat, and then I'd let it cool off, and just, wah, and just, I just pushed my way in there every day, you know, just for a hundred yards through that silt and mud. And, and, uh, there's lots of stories to that event, but I don't know how far. That's what I, I want to hear them. It's 10 years past Edwin. I want to hear these stories. Trouble. It still bothers me to this day. I got in trouble for having a 1975 Balsa B2 tied on. Like, you know, back in the day, you know, the cameraman would go down, they'd pan on your baits. And, you know, at the time I had a little finesse spinner bait tied on. I had a, a finesse jig tied on and I had a, a balsa Bagley B square bill crank bait. I mean, I still got a bunch of them. Made before you were born. Yes. Bought them on eBay for a hundred bucks a piece. And uh, I got reprimanded by the company that I was with that didn't even make a square bill for having that bait tied on. And uh, then I was no longer with that company. I was like, man, that's fine. If I'm gonna get in trouble for having something like that on, I I went a different direction after that event. It still bothers me to this day, man. I one, you know, did really good in the event and I talked about their bait, you know, and didn't bring up any other baits, but yet I still got in trouble because the camera caught a picture of me having a uh, <laughs> square build crankbait on. But anyway- Everyone it, was throwing it, that old square bill too. What's Aaron that? was throwing a bunch of guys were throwing those old yeah. square bills up there yeah. in the riffraff. But when you got so up I, there, didn't you get stuck and all that? Well, what happened? Like I was putting just enough gas to get in and out. Then the final day, you know, the or the second day or the final day of fishing that lake, uh, the wind blew out of I want to say the east, and it'd been kind of blowing out of the south or the west, and and I, I mean I was getting in and out. Well, that final day the wind blew out and it blew out. I'm gonna guess that much water. I really had to romp on it to get in there. Like it took me quite a bit more. Well, I, I, I mean, I am like getting in there with this much gas in the bottom of my tank. Like I've got exactly the enough fuel to get in and to get out. Like once I'm in there, I'm not even running my motor. And uh, man, I, I run out of fuel. Like I, I get back out and I'm just out of fuel. Like, so I had to call a service guy and I had to have them tow me in or I had somebody had to get me towed in, you know, to be able to make it back to the way in in time. But I, uh, I, I ran out of fuel. I, I, you know, looking back, I guess it was a, a bad decision. Maybe I should have put more, more fuel in there. Um, but it didn't cost me the event, you know, cause I think we went from that lake. I don't remember if the let if it ended that day or it ended the there because that was the one that Ike bailed on because his daughter was being born. Oh, okay. So he fished and left because I think it went Shelbyville and then Decatur. Yeah. Because they had yeah. a concert there in Decatur after yeah. it was over. That was a cool event. I uh, actually ran into my old football coach while I was at that event from Illinois. He came down to say hi, which was super cool. But uh, that was a super cool event. I just, you know, Aaron, I didn't beat Aaron. Aaron had him that day. I, I don't think I lost by much. And uh, he was throwing a square bill out there on the main lake, and I was trying to get up in that river. I remember Ott lost one on that under a dock, and it was legit lake record. Like oh, 100%, yeah. like lake record's like six pounds. Oh, and he wow. had one come up under a dock and everyone was like, that's legitimately probably one of the top three biggest bass that live in the wow. lake. Wow. And he was just like, oh, well, at least there's big ones in here. I remember. <laughs> he going, yeah, yeah, no, you caught the big one in the entire lake. <laughs> Look, the so big I one. had to still be in diapers then. If that was like, didn't he? I mean, if that was 10 years ago, he's not very old. I think it was odd. I remember his, I think it, uh, it, yeah, it had to have been. He's I remember, like the most mature young guy ever. Like, he well, was, yeah, he's not. Everybody looks at him as he's old, but he's not very old. He's pretty young. I uh, I remember when he won or his first year on the Elite Series, he never caught a single bass deeper than eight foot the entire year. He pretty much does that now. Nah, he likes to get out of the. He likes to plug. He'll plug deep plug a little bit. I guess it does top out at about eight, doesn't he? he likes the shallower. 
Yeah, he doesn't like only if he has to, has to. He will, mm. and that'll be he'll find that tournament day because he will exploit that shallow bite for every day of practice and the first day of the tournament if he yeah. has to. 2012 Elite Series mm. All Star semifinal. His rookie year was 2011, so it would have been his uh, second year on tour. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a uh, take another break here, and when we come back, I want to talk about uh, iCast. I want to talk okay. your plans moving forward. I'd be remiss if we didn't mention the uh, the YouTube channel that you created an absolute animal over there. It's a, it's amazing how some guys can, can start it and just have trouble gaining traction, and yours just has skyrocketed. And I'll like watch something and be like, dude, they, he's like giving up the juice. Like you give up a lot of stuff on there. I want to get your thoughts on that. Do you ever worry about that? Do you ever get done with a video and go, I, 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 I don't know if I want that to be out there, but it's too late now. Hold your thought on it. We're, we're going to take a break. When we come back with Edwin Evers, we'll get his thoughts on that. It's BTL on a Wednesday, June 29th. Vibrating jigs are a great choice for any time of year, and the Kamikaze Swim On is a perfect match for any vibrating jig. Two sizes and the unique tail design gives it a bait fish profile and a great swimming action for realism. There are 17 colors. See them all at BigBiteBaits.com. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years, and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat, so you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md elite series pro daryl gleason here my pro guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days always plenty of juice never fail the best part about pro guide batteries it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different and really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.exonlures.com and check them out for yourself. Combining one of the most popular hook styles with Gamakatsu's beefier Superline offering, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend delivers the strength necessary to target big fish in heavy cover. Well suited for braided line and heavier fluorocarbon, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend is built using stronger Superline wire that allows anglers to easily fish a finesse worm around heavy cover. The Round Bend offers a larger bite area, perfect for any worm presentation, while increasing your hookup ratios. The newly enhanced Z-Bend holds your plastics on the hook longer, reducing the number of pull-offs and reducing damage to plastics. Available in 2-aught, 3-aught, 4-aught, and 5-aught, this is the most durable worm hook, designed for heavier lines that hold your bait on longer. Preparation is key to success. And that preparation starts well before you ever hit the water. You're only as strong as your connection to the fish, and your line is that critical connection. Confidence in your line every minute, every day on the water, is a necessity, and failure, it's not an option. Sunline makes the fluorocarbon, nylon, and braided lines to give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. The new Android series is the peak of the Denali lineup and offers the ultimate Denali experience. The Android series features 36-ton multi-directional graphite combined with interlock blank technology for added strength. 
Each rod is outfitted with royal titanium guides that will not fail. The blank is fitted into an easy touch, soft feel EVA foam grip with exposed blank reel seat. This all allows the Android to transmit every movement of your bait and even the most subtle bites. The Android series is the finest rod Denali has ever made and offers an angler the ultimate fishing experience with a limited lifetime warranty. See the full lineup of Android rods at DenaliRods.com. Welcome back to BTL, talking with uh, YouTuber Edwin Evers. <laughs> YouTuber, huh? Yeah. Come on, man. You've got uh, 65, almost 66,000 followers now. Content pumping out consistently. I remember when this thing started, Project D. Like, listen, we've seen a lot of guys start out. They'll do the flashy intro. They'll be good for a month or two, and then it slowly starts to fade away as the tournament seed starts up. And then it's just like once a month or maybe some fish catches thrown together. But, I mean, dude, this was a business decision for you, wasn't it? It was. It was, uh, you know, kind of started during COVID, and uh, I was, I was kind of glad I did it. it, it it's, uh, I had a lot more fun doing it than I realized I, I would, that I ever thought I would have, just getting to fish. It made me go fish new lakes, not just going to the same old lakes. It made me, it made me get out more, you know, like when I get home, a lot of times I get pretty busy working on the pecan farm or you know, just working here around the house and, and, you know, it, it has made me go fishing. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed it. You know, I, I will not say I can see how somebody could, uh, start it and quit because of the amount of work it is. I am I just, it is a very in daunting task to, to feed that machine. Um, uh, you know, to, to try to catch fish and to, to talk about it and to come up with videos and ideas. And um, it's been a, a, a huge undertaking, but I've also really, really enjoyed it. And I've got to meet a lot of people through it. And, 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 and I've gotten a lot of great feedback that really kind of justifies why I do it. You know, you brought up the whole giving up too much information. I mean, that, that information in my mind is, is, out there now with all the live aspects of, of, you know, the Bass Pro Tour and the elites and all the different tournament coverage that we have, you can see all that, you know, it's all, nothing's hidden anymore. And, and, uh, you know, so I just felt like, you know, it's, 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 it's people need to know people, you know, there's, I don't know if they need to know, they want to know. Um, so just trying to help the fellow angler, you know, become better. And, and at, at the end of the day, you can still lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And so, you know, there's some people that are going to be able to really use it. And there's some people that probably are still trying to learn how to tie a knot. So hopefully there's a little bit of it all in the channel for those people. Yeah. I just know last, uh, last year you had one video and I was literally watching your video for 20 seconds, pausing it, then going over to the other programs that you said I needed to download, downloading it. Got, I mean, I did it all literally step by step. It took, and I, at the end I was like, holy cow, it worked. <laughs> it, it, was, it was pulling the waypoints off of Google mm-hmm. and putting them on your learn. That was a good one. You know, maybe I should have gave mean, that one. I, I felt like everybody knew that, but I guess they did. It was, got it was mind blowing for me. I was like, I, okay, I marked all of it all. And I was like, Dude, not I before that I had had like a single converter and I was take each one and convert it and then write it down on pay and then go out. I mean, it was it was life changing. Huh. I had an event in Kansas on Milford. You want to talk about a lake with four bass in it, Milford? I I give that one the I give that one the beans every time I can. And yeah. I'm sure it could be great, but uh, you know, there's low water deal there, and I went around and got me a hundred waypoints on it and put it all in there. I'm like, holy cow, I got everything. I got yeah. it all. Now I went out. It and gives you a lot of confidence when you went to that lake, yeah. didn't it? I mean, you yeah, because you're driving to something. You're driving to yeah. something that looks and you you're like, dude, I know what's down you, there. That you know you can go fish that you that looks like it should ha- have a bass on it. You know, I, I, I have hundreds upon hundreds of waypoints on any lake I may go to that I have found off Google Earth, and I may not fish any of them. I may only fish 10 of them, or I may get to try to fish all of them, but I have always feel like I've got more to fish in front of me than I can ever fish. Yeah. Instead of like, there's this one foundation. I'll never forget it. There's a one foundation. I found out in a big gnarly stump off to the front right of the foundation. So I was like, why? I, it doesn't take me an hour to transfer a billion weight 
points off of Google Earth now. I was like, so I had the back, right, back, left, front, left, front, right, and the stump. I'd never been there before. It looks like I'm in the middle of the dang cove, and I make a cast, and I know that I am casting my underspin off the right front corner of the dock between the the uh, or of the foundation between the foundation and the stump. Yeah. You, and you that's brought up because Shelbyville of you. earlier. I found three stumps on Shelbyville on Google Earth, and that's where I caught mm-hmm. those like two and three and four pounders. I mean, I caught a lot of my fish off Shelbyville off Google Earth. Yeah, it gives you so. Uh, it's weird how a little dot can give you so much confidence, even if you've never been there or fished it before, just based on what you've seen and what it looks like when you combine. If you combine, are you you do Navionics? Do you do the C Map? Do you do it all? I, I got mainly CMAP, but I obviously carry Navionics, you know, as a backup to it. Uh, you, you've got to have as many of those maps as you possibly can. But I, I've been really impressed with CMAP and, and how good those lakes are with what they've done. It, it just, to me, it gives me so much confidence if I can go out and say, all right, here's my game plan. This is this third of the lake, and I've got 35 areas that I want to look. Now, it doesn't always go that way, but on a lake that I've not been to or com- – you look at it and you see those little dots and you're like, all right, game plan. Otherwise I'm like, kind of like a lost puppy out there. Just like bite, <laughs> like biting off the head of the dandelion. It's just all right, let's, let's go over here. Let's run over here. You know what I mean? Are you the same way like that? too? Oh, yeah. Do you have like a game yeah, plan? Yeah. Then, then I feel like I'm just fishing what's visible or, you know, I I'm fishing what I feel like everybody else is trying to fish. You know, I, I like to have little things that I feel like are off the beaten path. If you can. I also like that you employ some history on your channel, like you do the uh, uh, Stacy King, Tommy Martin, the Rick Cluns, Paul Elias, like just sitting down and telling some of the history of the sport. I love that stuff. You know, I just, for me, that's that's the people that I grew up following and, and idolize. And uh, uh, they've all got really, really neat stories and, and how they got to where they're at. You know, so many young anglers are looking – to become a professional angler and they don't know the path or, or how each guy got there. And, and there's, there's no right way or wrong way to do it. And I feel like, you know, by asking people that and, and how they got to become a pro fisherman is a, is a way that'll help those young anglers maybe figure out their path to get there. It's good stuff. Um, coming up. Is it next or do you have one before it? I don't have the schedule up anymore. Uh, ICAST. ICAST 2022, Orlando, Florida. Are you yes, you sick of going to ICAST every single year? Oh, no, I like it. I like it. It's a, it's it, you know, especially this year, it's going to be, you know, something that it's not sandwiched between a bunch of other events. But, uh, you know, it's good to go down there and see a lot of the people you don't see very often. And, and uh, you know, with me now being with Pure Fishing over the last four or five years, how many ever it is, uh, you know, I pretty much just stay in their booth. We'll go to the, I'll go to the Lawrence booth some, and and uh, uh, it's just pretty simple. You know, I got a pretty basic schedule and get to visit about fishing tackle all day. I, I think it's it's what I dreamed to do as a fishing as a kid. You know, be able to talk about fishing tackle. You got any more high end commercials coming up lately? I always like those, like the not the fishing commercials, but like you know the whole production. I'm assuming you have like a a nice charcuterie board at those events. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> it's funny you bring up computer lunch reports. spread did not know what one of those were until you brought up the commercial general tire sent me a, a i can't even say that word they a charcuterie me. board I'm it's like, meat m- meat on wood meat and yeah, cheese on wood it's a wood but they call it charcuterie <laughs> board. so now we own like a couple of them and thanks to general tire they sent us one but no they usually do those in the fall and uh, we don't have anything on the calendar yet but It'll be anything fun. any uh any exciting iCast uh releases that you can tease without getting in trouble a couple weeks before um there's a couple things coming um uh, heck you know i've been working really hard for a couple years on a spinnerbait and uh there's you know everybody thinks that a, that a spinnerbait's a spinnerbait but i feel like i've got something different in this spinnerbait and and when somebody ties it on and they reel it in they're going to realize it instantly so uh it's a pretty cool spinner bait i'm pretty excited about it what makes a good spinner uh, okay i'll be honest i've got them all i mean i do i have them all i own them all i tie on a war eagle and for some reason it just feels right i can't tell the difference all the blades spin everything looks the same you can yeah. have jason christie who's like ah oh, you need this blade and blah 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 and gold and the painted makes it dull and the wire dia but like 
for some reason, a war eagle to me, you reel it and it just, it just feels right. Like I'm re- yeah. reeling the three quarter ounce war eagle next to a dock post on grand. I'm like, that thing's going to get eaten. I reel any other spinner bait and I'm like, eh, it might get a bite. What is yeah. it that, that is special about a spinner bait? You know, uh, what's for me, it's, it's a, it's a feel, uh, obviously the feel you, you said it there a bunch, you know, the feel and, and how it, 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 moves the water that comes through it but something that i've added into this spinner bait is is a sound and like oh, it, really? the name of it really ought to be called the grinder because it it sounds like you're just grinding rocks when that thing comes through the water and in oklahoma and and spinner bait water in general it's a dirty water technique and man this spinner bait like it is so phenomenal like i have so much confidence in it because you can hear it like when you like this drag it by the side of the boat it's like it's just like everything's kind of like grinding against everything and it is just such a cool spinner bait like the sound aspect of it um and and how it feels coming through the water it is like it is a fish catching machine and and uh i'm pretty excited about it did i see where you guys have some sort of weird bladed jig thing coming out too I saw it on a public forum. Was that not it? Yeah, it's called the Slobber Knocker. If you're not, yeah. like, you're going to have a lot of fun Have I been living that. under a rock? Huh? Yeah, it, it's have really I been cool. living under a rock? It, 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 what's neat and unique about it, you know, everybody's got bladed jigs, but well, how I feel like this one's going to be a little bit better over others is that it's uh, it's got kind of a, a banana concave head. And, like, if I'm ever skipping docks, that's the one I want to have tied on because you can skip it like a dream. So if you come out with your own spinner bait, are people going to say that you copied all the other spinner baits? Oh yeah, just like copied. Uh, what was that? I get reamed all the time because uh, somebody thinks that I copied the, the agent E. You know, I wasn't going to bring it up, but you bring it up for the spinner baits. And I went off. Uh, I was on the phone the other day with the buddy, and I went off, and I was like, "So what? Like, you make one worm, and it's like, okay, man's jelly worm. That's the only plastic worm on. Like, at at what point?" It's like a, a category of bit. What are your thoughts on that? Because listen, I guarantee res- there's people on here going, Matt's not going to ask you about the age and E. My response to it is we'd all still be driving model T's. If we did not improve on the vehicle. We'd, I mean, think about that. Would you not? I mean, the model T yeah. vehicle, or model T was the very first one out. If that's all you're ever going to have, that's all you're ever going to have. How many different variations of a, of a rattle trap are out there? How many different variations of whatever bait it is? We'd like, all be throwing an oaky bug still. Yeah, I mean, uh, or uh, a paper clip spinner bait. Well, like, what was the very first one of those? You know, with the the big round bend on it. You know, yeah, the Agent E is 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 a very similar bait to other baits out there, but man, it's it's a different bait too. Like it is. I loved, I, you know, I was with Mega Bass before mm-hmm. and they had the dark sleeper and it was a very different, unique bait, but it didn't fit what I wanted it to do. Like, you know, it, 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 it's good and say a certain finesse situation, you know, with the size hook and, and how it was built and the colors for it. To me, were not colors that I need here in Oklahoma or that I need in Florida or I need it in Alabama. And, and man, I just took that idea and improved on it and that's the fishing industry i I don't understand why people sit there and and say what they did because everything's been improved on we'd still have the same spinner bait we'd still have the same rattle trap we'd still have the same everything and 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 they're two different baits completely you know i'm not going to get into it but i can tell you why i I really like mine and why i think it works you ever fish that thing like an lbj oh yeah (laughs) It's good stuff. Have I ever? Absolutely. Yeah. No, it's it's a, yeah, but it's it's a deal. Just like a regular jig. Mm-hmm. That's what it's meant for. It's not a swim bait. Skipping you know? it around docks. And I think that's what you know. People look at that thing and they think of uh, they think of it as a swim bait, but it's really built to fish as a jig or a football jig or a, a finesse jig, and and uh, it skips like a dream. And and with that fiber weed guard that I put on there, that 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 mono guard. Uh, the hookup percentage on is through the roof. And, and I put a, a hard chin, like, like, you know, so much of that bait you drag and uh, you, you lift and you drop, you lift and you drop. Well, with that hard chin, 
one, it protects the plastic to where the bait will last a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, it, that hard chin's a rattle in it, but it also adds the noise of when it hits a rock or hits a dock, dock post. Uh, it's pretty cool bait. There's I was thinking as much, uh, as much publicity as hot as those things are, do you think that's the, it hasn't won a major tournament, has it? No, no, like no. the Dark Sleeper or the, or the, uh, Berkeley or the, and, I'm trying to think that's a bait that has winning potential. Does it not? Like, I mean, is it just cause it's new enough, but I was looking back, trying to find, and I'm shocked that that hasn't won yet because it seems to be very applicable for a lot of different species from North all the way to South. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, a lot of people looked at it in, initially as a, as a goby and, and obviously it does look a lot like a goby, but uh, no, I, it's a bait that, man, I, I caught them in texas earlier this year on it's a bait that uh, you'll catch on outside grass lines it's a, it, it's a bait you'll catch north to south anywhere you'll throw a jig basically yeah all right uh i want to get a couple more things in here before we let you go i appreciate you jumping on for an hour that's uh that's big uh what is pecan season is it like pecan season now or is that like christmas time no they're just growing right now i mean it's always pecan season but as far as uh harvesting them that that starts in october and everybody's uh buying them up by november 1st so all right we'll have fresh pecans by then and then how much are you going to be charging per pound channel cat when your pay lake opens <laughs> channel cat there's not going to be channel cat in there you're not, i thought you were doing a pay lake you're not doing a pay lake no a channel cat pay lake what are we what are we digging out then no i'm just making a man i i, I i'm making a couple ponds here just we had so much time i've, I've always kind of a long story like you know, I said I used to be single and I was saving money back in the day to buy a bulldozer. You know, I had a piece of land down in southern Oklahoma and uh, I wanted to buy a bulldozer. I just thought that would be like the coolest thing ever to own a bulldozer. And I was saving this money. And then I met my wife and I had to spend that money on a ring and uh, I never did get my bulldozer. So last year I bought a bulldozer with this plans of building this big, nice lake. Well, two years ago. I've been dealing with the Corps of Engineers and permits and, and, and we're working through that process. It's a, it's a long process, but in the meantime, I, I built a couple ponds and I thought it would be super cool to stock a pond with smallmouth. And, uh, I did some research on it and, and you can, you can do that. So I, I got to get, get, get some more water in it. We're going to stock it with smallmouth and I've got done with it and I'm building another pond above it. And I thought it'd be really cool to stock it with hybrid bluegill. I, I'm going to put a handicap dock on it and, I've got some family members and church members that uh, I think, and myself included, that I think it'd be really cool to catch two and a half pound hybrid bluegill. Wow. According to, to Steve Barden, he says they will grow to two and a half to three pounds if I don't have largemouth in there and I feed them. Wow. Are these like an acre, two acres, five acres? No, they're small. Uh, the the smallmouth pond is probably three quarters of an acre. The hybrid bluegill pond will be about. And that's going to work. According to everybody I've done, like, like I visited. The, uh, the, the, the Peoria tribe up there you know, did a social deal for them and where they raise the smallmouth is a three quarter acre muddy pond. Like there's no spring in it. There's no nothing. That's where you, where you go to buy your fish. It's a three quarter acre pond right here in Oklahoma and they sell fish all over the country. So uh, as long as it doesn't have large mouth in it, the research I've done, you know, large mouth will way out compete a small mouth in, in a farm pond. But if you do not have largemouth, you've got, you know, the, the small bluegills and the and the fathead minnows and, and you supplement feed them, you can grow them to four to five pounds, supposedly in a pond. I will let you know as this develops. Well, the smallmouth can survive, then you could definitely put sauger in there. I got it. I, I don't know. Yeah, that'd be good. I've never, I just have never heard of a smallmouth pond. Have you? I've read How did that them. even come out just because you'd heard about them and you wanted one and you like smallmouth? No, I've read about them. So, yeah, oh, okay. I've obviously heard about them. You realize if you win uh, the next BPT at Cayuga, you have won. You're one of the only guys who have won uh, three events on three different bodies of water in New York. That would be cool. Thousand Where Islands, Buffalo, and then Cayuga. That would be super cool. You never won on Champlain? I feel like that would suit your style. You come close ever? Um, I don't think I've ever been really close. Maybe 10th or 12th. Uh, 
No, that place, man, that's a big old body of water. I'm always so torn between south and north and in the middle. And I keep telling myself one of these days, like, you know, I, I'm always against going and pre-practicing events and spending time at those events. Uh, but that would be one lake that it would be well worth my time to go spend a couple of weeks and just learn exactly where all those fish live. Cause I always end up going down some rabbit hole and not seeing another boat all day long, trying to find the mother load where nobody ever goes. All right. Well, Edwin, that made you rub your face, Matt. What happened there? Huh? <laughs> what was that about? No, just the, I'm just thinking, Log, the log runs and Ticonderoga and, and Champlain. Like it's always just, I remember covering all those tournaments. You talk to those guys, it's always decisions, decisions, decisions. Oh, and then, yeah. and then everybody ends up just stacked up next to a blow through catching the same fish that drifts past everyone else. Yeah. But all right. Uh, I gotta get the music queued up here. There it is. You're welcome. Yeah, I gotta get you on BTL more, dude. All right. Anytime, anytime you get through the, Oklahoma City area. I'll come over. I got to get you in studio. I had Zach Burge in studio. I got to get Luke Palmer up here in studio. So uh, it it sounds like you've been enjoying your time off, digging holes, hanging out with the family, being a grandpa, shooting YouTube stuff. And then it's uh, time to get back to business on the water. So thanks, Edwin. All right. Thank you, Matt. This has been BTL on a Wednesday tomorrow, day four with Frank Scalish. We'll see you then. Do you do one of these every...